what I really love about watchmaking is that behind a simple mechanical watch, there are at least 150 tiny parts that make the watch mechanism work. My favorite part of the movement is the balance wheel, which is really the beating heart of the watch. Watchmaking to me is so fascinating because there is so much craftsmanship involved. It's so hard to master the skills of watchmaking. One of the most challenging parts of watchmaking is the dexterity involved. You need to be able to pick up the parts, but also to make very, very fine adjustments. When I first show them a Patek Philippe watch, there's two things. First, they think, wow, it's all so small. The second thing is that usually they are amazed by the decoration and the finishing of the components, because each component has been finished to such a high standard, but also for the components that no one except the watchmaker will ever see. I went to a flea market and that is where I found this mechanical watch. And I'd never heard of something like that before. So I went on the internet and I found out that there was such a whole world of watchmaking. I've always seen my mom making sculptures, doing photography, and there's so much craftsmanship involved in those things that I think that really had a big influence in me. I would try to buy some beautiful old watches that I would try to repair. I would try to find information everywhere in books, on the internet. So I was very deep into this whole watchmaking. They have to do some tests that really shows their manual dexterity and it also tests whether they have enough patience to do this sort of job. The reason why I like watch making is the process of figuring out how the things work. I enjoy the process of problem solving. Even when I'm working as a video editor, I think it's kind of the same. I like to assemble things, like uh, small things together with my hand. When I was a kid, I remember that when I tried to fix the clock in the house, I could not fix it. And I'm curious to know about this. And I kept this curiosity with me. One of the things I learned that I think is, is very important is how to be patient. And there is no shortcut way to fix the watch.
From young, I was a very practical person. I like to do hands-on stuff. Watchmaking is a very specialized and niche industry. You can't really get that in Asia. To me, this was a very good opportunity to venture out. Different watches tell different stories. You can actually tell how the owner cares for the watch through the outlook of the watch. Sometimes the watch can be from 1980s, but the watch can still look good. So you know that the owner doesn't really wear it. You can have a watch in the 2000s, but you can have dents all over the watch because the owner wears it every day. A watchmaker has to understand that when they work on someone's watch, often this watch has been a gift from a mother to a daughter or people who have a close bond to someone. So you have to realize the emotional attachment to these watches. It's not enough just to make it functional, it has to be more than just functional. Even the oldest pocket watches, for example, take a watch from the 1850s, Patek Philippe promises to repair these watches and do so in the same way as they were originally produced. I remember very well when I was young, my mom, she would drag me to museums and to art galleries and I really didn't like it. But as I got older, I became more and more interested in visiting museums. There are artisans who are making these external parts of the clocks. So you have engravers, people doing wood marquetry. You have people doing enamel. You have a special type of enamel called cloisonné enamel. What makes watchmaking so special is that each component in the watch has to be just right and everything has to fit exactly right together. But apart from that, a properly functioning watch needs a human touch. It needs a watchmaker to make the final adjustments so that everything runs just precisely. of the house is very masculine. We wanted the inside to have a soft touch. I think there's a fair play of pink and blue in the house to balance up the fact that I have four boys. I moved here since I was six. Back then, it was a very small park. Also, we'll go there for this hide and seek and catching. But now he has grown to a very big park. I think we have a lot of fond memories here. We are very thankful that we managed to find a nice piece of land here, our dream home. With the park connector, you have the ease of accessibility, but the trade-off is you, you have a lack of privacy and people can just stare into your house. He draws all kinds of houses. He, they're, they're the kind that he draws for my development arm. We spoke a, a lot about doing a dream home even before we got this land. Then we always joke about it. You know, if the chance comes, let's do it together. There was a lot of emphasis on the security and privacy. There's a hierarchy of privacy as the, the levels increase, right? Tuition teachers that comes by for their kids are on the first level. 
as you ascend to the second level, it's probably like for his immediate family and friends, I say, in, the, in his inner circle. Instead of uh, having the living room on the ground floor, we brought it up to the second floor. We have a more ventilated and airy, true wind living room. We have a living room with no pillars, and this is very important for us because we spend a lot of time in this area. The whole point that we wanted the living room to be open, um, so the kids, they have uh, constant access to the pool. So most of the time when they are free, they will just jump into the pool, especially when the cousins are here. They said how happy the boys were trying to catch a Pokemon with their mobile apps throughout the entire trip. We just have this very spontaneous talks with them. Why we just custom a pattern out of Pokemon element to the swimming pool. The whole family loves Pokemon. With Sojuno's help, he actually materialized it, which is really very impressive. We started the project with monochromatic and earthy palette, but as we get to know the owner better, we slowly introduce a bit more fun, a bit more bold colours and elements to the project. And that's how this project takes its own shape and identity. So it's really lucky to have someone actually incorporate all the pink into the house. Every day we come back, right, you just feel very happy. We designed rooms to be similar and identical, but the boys get to pick their own colours for the wall. We also use the terrazzo element for the TV feature. This is to bring up the playfulness of the kids' room. They really like to spend a lot of time together playing games. When you put four boys together, anything is fun. So the fourth floor is designed for Willie and Jessica as their, their retreat, right? So it's kind of like a resort on its own that enjoys the best views. The balcony serves the purpose of connecting back to nature. It also allows us to relax, uh, people watch. So the fourth floor, it consists of sitting rooms at one end and then we have the bedrooms and the headboard on the other end. In the middle, we have this a swivel TVs where it can be used from the sitting side as well as from the bed side. Sujuno has brought in the sunlight and we spend quite a bit of time there. I love to dance. One of the dance itself that allows me to really display all the elements and character, I feel that pole dance is one of them. The pole dance area, right, it's really an art piece by itself to me because it provided me a stage to perform. It's nice to see as a designer when we try to control less, we let the project grow its own identity and takes its own shape. I think my proudest moment is when the owners called to express their happiness after moving in and how it actually value added to their lives. So for me, a dream house is uh, beyond material. It is uh, coming back to a house and seeing the five people that are very important to you enjoying every single second that they spend in the house and uh, 
using the house as to how you, you have planned for it. At my dad's stall, I really learned about thinking on your feet. There's no time for you to think too long. So how to make the guests happy, that was my most important lesson there. I'm the only son in the family, so helping out at a stall, it seems natural. I hated it, but slowly I find the hang of it, and then I really like serving guests and seeing guests smiling. So that really changed the whole aspect of it. Our backbone is Singaporean cuisine, like dishes that you know, the laksa, Hainanese chicken rice, bakute. How do I put it into a more refined version to bring it to the international stage? The Chinese name of panggang is chou wei xiang tou. I wanted to use the pungent ingredients to share it with the local guests. So the prawn paste, fish sauce, and patai, which is very normal to us. For the local Taiwanese, it's not their daily stuff. So I wanted to challenge that. This dish is very controversial because not everyone likes these flavors. I wanted to share flavors, ingredients, and culture aspect of Southeast Asia or Singapore. He's selling fish head curry, his signature dish. I really like his curry sauce. It's so smooth and drinkable. When I was in primary school, I would go and help at the store, cleaning dishes, ordering food, or serving dishes to the guests. When I was strong enough to hold the wok, I even helped cook some simple dishes. What I brought from my dad's store or his business is to serve the customer well. Cooking good food is the most basic thing. The most important aspect of me is to make the guests happy. I enrolled myself into a culinary school because when I learned from my dad, um, you know, they are the old school teaching method, like um, a scoop of this, a tablespoon of that. Everything is not measured out. When I got interested into cooking, I really wanted to know the scientific aspect of it as well. Everyone Three weeks before opening, I realized that the menu had no soul. It's not me at all, it's not Jimmy. And I asked myself a lot of questions. I wanted to showcase Singaporean cuisine. And then we did a big shift into it to change the whole restaurant style to modern Singaporean cuisine. Every dish, you have to go to a trip to a Singapore trip. It tells you the taste. But besides the taste, you can also add it to its description. Maybe what the taste of my dad's food. We started cooperating with this farm, Seming Li Sen Tai Nong Yuan, because I can't get fresh Southeast Asian ingredients here. So when somebody introduced the farmer to me, I was ecstatic to be able to get fresh ingredients there. 
The farmer is very cool. He went to Indonesia, he stayed there for a while, and then he really enjoyed Southeast Asia ingredients. And he bring it back to Taiwan, and then he started to grow them. He said, if I have a chance, I will get a reward. My these people who are growing with me, everyone can have a place to live together. He actually has changed a lot in these two years. He is very focused on the team's growth and cooperation. 他也非常注重客人的需求。Taiwan has made me more calm. I used to be very pushy when I first came to Taiwan, but I realized that the renting way in Taiwan reminds me of my dad's store in the hawker center. The community, the warmth, the kindness that they showed to each other. Singaporean flavor is important to me because this is where I'm born, where I come from. I'm Singaporean, and Singaporean flavor to me is home. The Yakun uh, Kaya Toast. I turned it into a dessert. We made an edible eggshell and then Kaya ice cream with a salted butter espuma. And then we dusted it off uh, on top with a uh, coffee powder. I think my father will be proud and I hope that he's proud. Although we are both chefs, but we are both cooking on different platforms and catering to different guests. I hope what I'm doing now has some part of him that brings along with me to wherever I go and results that I have achieved. <laughs>